So welcome to Bilateral Bites, everyone. And today we're going to discuss pandemics, education, and the future of youth. There's been a lot of discussion about how the pandemic has impacted, obviously, as a health crisis, and in particular, as an economic crisis. But one of the untold stories is the education impact from the perspective of students. Today, I'm fortunate enough to have with me Dikit Bhattacharya, a third year economics student from Delhi University, which is one of the top ranked public universities of India, and Mahika Mathur, an MBA student from BML Munjal University, a fast up and coming uh, private university, which is currently six years old and initiated by the Hero Group. Um, BML Munjal University is specializing in innovation and thought leadership as part of blending STEM and liberal arts thinking. So first of all, Dikit and Mahika, welcome to Bilateral Bites. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask you, there's been a, a huge impact to the delivery of education, uh, quite obviously all around the world. Uh, from your perspectives, have there been uh, both challenges and benefits in the delivery of education in this new, this new world we're in? And if so, what are they? Dikis, I'll, I'll put the question to you first. Uh, I think the disruptive impact of COVID is, has been such that indeed uh, processes that, processes of change particularly that take years in order to fructify have, have been forced through in a matter of days. And here primarily the challenge is not conceptual. The challenge is not phenomenological. The challenge is of translating policy into action, of translating uh, thought into action. And here we see that indeed there are uh, a lot of uh, structural deficiencies, not the least being infrastructure, but indeed uh, the administration, educators, people who design the syllabus, as well as students, uh, have been caught significantly off guard as to when it comes to coping uh, with the change that is being forced through uh, in such a short time. However, there is also a realization across all stakeholders of the panoply of pluses that come with it, including, most importantly, flexibility for all of those involved. And here you see, indeed, uh, as the Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller complains repeatedly, that it's incredibly slow to affect change. And... COVID-19 has come as an opportunity for us to leapfrog mm. into a future that would have taken otherwise years, even though it is indeed obviously something uh, that can be put into practice. No, really well said. So I think often we think about innovation as a force for disruption, as the internet has been uh, since its creation. And here we're faced with a a really interesting challenge where disruption is forcing innovation forcing. and we're, moved to, we're moving with much greater alacrity than ever before. No, it's a really interesting observation. Mahika, can I ask you about your experiences and the challenges or benefits you've faced during this time? Uh, while growing up, we're all taught uh, that change is not constant. Uh, well, change is the only thing that's constant and we need to be dynamic. We need to adjust to situations. And yet, uh, nobody could predict such a change that would come to our life. And yet, we're all uh, in this together. I think the whole world is facing the same thing. And we're on the same page. So it gives us the opportunity to differentiate ourselves right now. To, mm. uh, it gave me time to work on myself, uh, not only on the corporate side, but my creativity uh, to uplift my skills in a way that I can be differentiated from others since we're on we're all in the same boat we're all on the same page so where there are challenges I think the one who conquers them is the one who can I mean who I think is better to go ahead right yeah that's a wonderful observation as well so even in the multilateral space Prime Minister Modi and others have been talking about a more human-centric future, a human-centric multilateralism in dealing with other countries, human centrism as the tenant of self-reliant India, as he said last week in his speech on the 12th of May. And um, even now you're talking about self-reflection and a way in which we can think about our personal skills and development and how we are as human beings in addition to the skills that we acquire through tertiary education. 
So I think that's a really wonderful and, and well pointed out reflection. Dikit, you're a third year student in economics. I'm interested, often we've heard about an economics perspective from world leading economists and some of India's great economists as well. As a student, you'll also be taking your place in the future um, in, in academia or, or business or whatever it is you choose to do. What's your sense as a, as a student of economics looking out on the impact of coronavirus? This is something that's not currently in your textbook, but I imagine is going to be in future textbooks about a massive global disruption. Do you have any thoughts or reflections as a student of economics right now? Uh, indeed, there are a few things that are, that are becoming increasingly apparent. Uh, the least of all is, of course, that while globalization is here to stay, it is the nature of globalization itself which will undergo fundamental change. And with it uh, come a range of network effects that will fundamentally reorient uh, the way uh, we not just live in the world, but perceive it as well. So the first and foremost, if we say focus on the education sector itself, uh, even right now, as we see data streaming in, mm. uh, startups in not just uh, fintech or agrotech, but even uh, startups in educational technology have been one of those few bright spots that are not currently not in a loss as it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. So even though for it to peter down to the lowest level, mm. it will take quite some time. But it's, rather, uh, but it's rather interesting to see indeed that the adoption of educational technology across the board has definitely taken a fillip. Now, at the same time, however, there is a word of caution indeed as to what is the purpose of education itself. And when it comes to that, especially, say, in the Indian paradigm, education has been conceived of as a force for not just um, creating better skilled individuals, but uh, creating uh, citizens out of subjects of, an in, of a people involved within the democratic setup as to question and ponder and constantly improve themselves. So the risk remains, as Mark Hodge said a long time ago, that there may be a risk of an apotheosis of Gesellschaft, that indeed we may become so removed from our social context that it would be easy for us to imagine that it does not even exist. So that behavioral change can also have a big economic impact as you see further consumerism and, uh, uh, and it drives for um, the kind of reckless greed that has put uh, that has put many a people into the spot. And in our recent past, India is the only country that has a CSR law. It was the first. So indeed, we, we have been thinking about it for some time. And this disruption is another opportunity for us to frame our perspectives as to what we expect out of the future and what we, sh what we ought to expect out of the future. Certainly, there's some really interesting observations that you've outlined there. Um, particularly CSR or corporate social responsibility, having that 2% tax dedicated towards a social benefit um, that companies have to invest in. I think that's a really important observation and one that has really changed um, or at least sought to change uh, the corporate culture in India. How do corporates give back and how do they have a, have a role in, in shaping the positive elements of society? Uh, so that's a really good observation. The other one is, I think, your point about citizens out of subjects, which is something that the new education policy draft, I believe, uh, seeks to do as well. So we can come back to that at the end of this podcast. Mahika, you're an MBA student and you've been, um, you know, looking at things from the perspective of business, but in quite an innovative way at BML Manjal University. How has the current crisis impacted you personally in terms of either perhaps employment paths you had um, thought you might take, the future of education, um, or your, your personal um, reskilling or, or other ideas you might have for your future? Um, I was worried initially after this what? pandemic was announced. I mean, uh, this year my I am supposed to be placed, right? And at the end of the year, my placement uh, okay. procedure was supposed to start. 
but uh, as uh, the college is very supportive they've been conducting so many uh, webinars and um, a lot of activities and workshops which tell us that post covid uh, scenario for the country which will be that uh, you know every uh, cloud has a silver every dark cloud has a silver lining so even this cloud does and uh, there'll be sectors growing like e retail fmcg uh, telecom sector i think these pharmacy sector and insurance banking sector like these, these will grow and so now this is the opportunity we can I, we can see this as an opportunity and i can align my skills i can align my strengths according to these now in whichever sector i want to get into i can now upskill myself i can now do more uh, dedicated mm -hmm. activities and so from a perspective of student i think uh, yeah it is a challenge but this is the time i can differentiate myself i can come up with i can come out stronger from this pandemic by um, so our college gave us this uh, great opportunity of coursera we can do any course free online so i mean now i can do online research and do courses and do live project and so adapting to the situation coming out stronger i think uh, this is what this dark uh, cloud will teach us so that's a yeah that's really wonderful and i think you make an excellent point mahika about the ability to shape yourself towards the sectors that will be burgeoning in the future and particularly in india it's interesting dikit also mentioned edtech and that this has been giving a bit of a fillip to edtech Exactly. Certainly, Ronnie Scrivala, the head of Upgrad, the largest education platform in India, has been speaking a lot about this. And India has been very much on the front foot. You might recall that the finance minister back in February, before the COVID crisis, during her budget speech, spoke about the top 100 universities of India moving into um, providing full online degrees, which would be quite new for India. Um, and you've also mentioned telecommunications and some other sectors as well. Clearly we're on Zoom right now, which I think has got a higher market share than um, some of the major airlines understandably right now. But India again has been thinking about emerging as the cyber security um, leader of the world, as it has been the generic pharmaceutical provider of the world. So again, I mean, these are, these are very interesting sectors and one that India has already been thinking about. Um, I wanted to finish off with a question about the new education policy draft. I'm not sure if either of you are aware of the new education policy. It has been in the media last year as well. It was uh, put out in June 2019. And I thought I'd ask you as current students, it's quite an impressive document that goes right from K to 12 learning all the way up to tertiary education. But as tertiary education students, the bit I wanted to focus on today is your views on the internationalization of education and online education as we've been discussing. Uh, Dikit, to you first, would this be a, a benefit for an Indian student um, in India or otherwise? And if so, why? I mean, definitely uh, it would be a, a very important change. So just to contextualize uh, this shift, it's important to see that our, say, top 100 institutions, when they were made or when they became prominent, the purpose of education as was back then was fundamentally different from today. Indeed, right now there is a very strong emphasis on application and on being innovative in a sense that you can give back to society in, a, in the manner of say uh, a new business or joining somewhere and being a dynamic force for good. So when that happens, the world back then and the world back and the world today are also fundamentally different. They globalized to an extent that was inconceivable barely 30 years ago. Mm. And in that context, the fact remains India and Indians will have interests abroad in a manner which uh, cannot be, uh, which could not have been envisioned barely a short time ago. We see big. Uh, uh, companies that are almost institutional in India, say the Tata Group or the Hero Group or Bharat Forge, they all have subsidiaries outside, they all have made acquisitions outside and we see Indian talent 
and foreign talent mingling in a way whereby the entire world can benefit through uh, systemic changes that are happening. So in this context, when we gain international exposure, not just to educators, but also with students from abroad, with different experiences, different insights, there is indeed uh, a uh, there, there's indeed a confluence of important uh, confluence of ideas of cultures happening. And if you go long back into our history, uh, India's educational prowess, the symbol of India's education prowess, has been the Nalanda University, indeed. and it was famous primarily because uh, Buddhist scholars used to come from across the world, from the corners of the world, from China, from Japan, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, to come back and and we saw how much India could give back to the world in the form of knowledge while gaining itself. So indeed, if we, if we see this uh, entire strand of thinking as to being global, uh, in that context, uh, it's a very exciting time uh, for the education sector as a whole. Sure. So I think it's quite interesting, the idea of internationalization in education in part isn't new, because since the thousands of years old Nalanda University based in Bihar, uh, with I think even Buddha having visited Nalanda University as one of the finest liberal arts universities um, and first in the world, uh, India has always been connected internationally and has been giving back as well um, as having a potential to receive information as a result of internationalization. And the second part of your point was that Today, given globalization and the opportunities that exist for Indians um, in other parts of the world as well, the more socialization and internationalization, the better. No, that's a um, very, very insightful. And, and Mahika, your views on internationalization and education? I think, uh, as since we know that 65, uh, India is a young country, 65% yeah. yeah. of our population is uh, young. And, uh, it, and as we know that there were the stats in the um, India today recently that 25% uh, of the students uh, just graduate from high school and uh, to go on to pursue their uh, uh, higher education. It's very important from the perspective that we need to educate our uh, and we need to educate them in globalization because it's the new thing. We Because of this pandemic, uh, we'll have many uh, companies joining, uh, many foreign investors coming in India to join us. Um, Haryana giving, uh, Haryana actually is adjusting its policies according to it. So I think it becomes really important for us to broaden the students' perspective and not only concentrate in um, how the Indian economics working, but um, see from the perspective of how global business is going to be do, done. And uh, I think, yeah. No, that's, a, again, a really excellent point because, again, you're weaving through the benefits of, um, of India's domestic policy and foreign policy coming together. So even since 2014, Prime Minister Modi has spoken about actively encouraging foreign direct investment and changed a number of um, sectors to allow for greater foreign direct investment, at some parts 100% FDI. Um, so part of that obviously is then socialising our youth, the up and coming leaders of, of business and government to in fact understand the benefits of that globalisation and be able to take part, including in bringing FDI back to India. So again, um, a really important point. Uh, as you've mentioned, ma the majority of India could be classified as, as youth. And in this way, India has spoken about the demographic dividend that it has. And all I can say is that with ambassadors like the two of you, Dikit and Mahika, India seems to be in excellent hands. Thank you very much for your time and your, your observation. I'm really impressed by the positivity and silver lining you've managed to glean from this time. I know it must be challenging not to have had the, the human impact um, of being in a classroom with, with classmates or being able to ask teachers directly in, in person as well. But it's amazing you've been able to reflect on the positive opportunities, benefits, possibilities, flexibilities, innovative reforms and change that this time can bring as well. So um, thank you both very much for your time. I think it's been a great discussion. Thank you for inviting me.